But the gimmick was fantastic. I could put my Enya CD in there and boom, a monster. Some might say the monster went into the drive. <laughs> <laughs> It represents the monster that's in me that emerges every time I listen to it. Uh, welcome back to Cartridge Base Radio. I'm Donald, once again joined by Brad. Hey! And we are once again joined by Mark. Hi! who has retired from Sonic to join us for our Halloween episode to talk about the spooky game of Nightmare Creatures. Well, if there's one thing I love, it's spooky stuff. And ironically, I've actually found that a shocking number of Sonic fans also love horror. It's a weird crossover. Yeah, I mean, they dive into that fanfic section of <laughs> the Sonic world, and it's chock full of horrors. <laughs> Pretty terrifying. <laughs> uh, Brad... Would you like to tell us about Nightmare Creatures? Uh, it's not very good. <laughs> huh. <laughs> well, so it apparently it came out not very good, and... <laughs> <laughs> um, came out uh, right around Halloween in 1997. I don't know, I can't remember this for sure, but it just would kind of go with the consistency of like nightmare creatures not being great that i think it actually like got delayed a week and ended up coming out like just after halloween but i might just be remembering that wrong but it did come out uh we'll be generous and say october of 1997 is published by activision developed by callisto it is a 3d action game it sort of vaguely looks like tomb raider and it plays like hot garbage yeah it, they made a sequel eventually for some reason. Just to prove that the first one wasn't as bad as it could be. <laughs> so I have an important question for you two. Yes. Have you ever encountered someone doing something that you're like, I don't think you should be doing that, so you burn down an entire city? <laughs> Man, do I have stories about Chicago. <laughs> because that's literally how this game starts. So like, He discovered he was working with dark witchcraft in 1666, so they burned down London. Samuel Pepys? Yes. Now, now, you do know that's a real person, right? And I do know the London fire is real, but the game's lore is we have to stop him by burning an entire city to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> we can't go into him with, like, swords and stuff. If we burn the whole city down, we will probably get him. Fire solves everything. <laughs> so, the game starts, what? In 1836, so... Okay, so... So I'm already a little confused about the timeline then. Okay, so there's this Order of Holy Dudes, and they're like, we're holy. Wait, isn't it the, isn't it the Order of Hecate? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trotting out the, the uh, lore here. So, but one of the guys is like, hey, I'm gonna start doing bad stuff. And then they're like, no, we're going to stop you. Right. This is in the 1800s or in the 1660s? No, this is this is 1666. Because see, 666. Ah. Man, that's brilliant. It's a horror game. It's very spooky. <laughs> so they burn down London. And then it jumps forward in time. And there's a dude named, is it Adam Crowley? Yes. They couldn't go Alistair Crowley. That was a little too on the nose. This is his brother. Uh, <laughs> they're like, we need a villain who looks like a Danzig action figure that you would buy at the dollar store and like is a knockoff. <laughs> and he, he sat in the dash of your car too long and his face has melted. <laughs> what if Rasputin did more meth? <laughs> And for some reason, like, they felt the need to, like, put him in the corner of the loading screen, like, all the time. <laughs> Looking shifty! <laughs> like, like a full motion video! <laughs> it's, like, it's not even just, like, a screenshot. It's, like, animated, just so he could look extra shifty. He's FaceTiming in to see how the good guys are doing. Like, you can't get me. Stop FaceTiming me, jerk. He's just, like, hanging out in the corner. He's like, ooh, twist a canine. Yeah. <laughs> I'm across this low fence that you can't get through. Ha ha ha. <laughs> I'm hiding in the encroaching darkness. Draw distance for the win. You just see the <laughs> sparkles of light off his greasy hair. <laughs> so, yeah, the game jumps to 1836. Like, it stays in 1666 for approximately four seconds. 
be like, okay, we started this fire. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so a guy gets a book and he's like, oh, this book talks about evil stuff. And Adam Crowley just at the same time happens to be doing evil stuff with monsters. So this guy and his daughter. Yes. They're like, we have to stop the monsters. My daughter happens to be a ninja. One of those jolly old English ninjas. But here's the thing. He's like a historian whose daughter decided to be a ninja. Like, how was that conversation? You're going to school to be an archaeologist like your father. I'm going to ninja school, dad. <laughs> Remember, this is also the world where uh, the priest shows up with a quarter staff. So, like... It was a rough town in it, London back then. I was just thinking, like, women's rights in the 1800s weren't what they are today. I, I don't think ninja was an occupation that was just, like, open to, to females that much. <laughs> you know, I mean, they couldn't even vote back then. I don't think ninja was a career opportunity. Not until after World War II, for sure. Well, Brad, you don't like announce publicly that you're a ninja you just become a ninja and then you're a ninja and no one can stop you i was gonna say perhaps the best ninjas are the ones we never knew about <laughs> i mean for all you know there could be a ninja sitting behind me right now maybe that was the whole reason the sexism existed was to like make it so no one would expect the female ninjas out there because it's like well you know they wouldn't ninjas aren't a thing and they certainly wouldn't <laughs> let women do it anyway and like secretly like <laughs> there are just all these ladies going around assassinating people burning down london so adam decides hey i'm gonna unleash monsters on the world because that's my evil plan and a priest, quarterstaff, and ninja girl are like, we have to stop this. And they're like, which one of us is going to go while the other one stays behind? <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing, is it doesn't follow up with like, well, the other had a separate adventure. It's like one of them's like, I'll just hang out here at the hotel room. <laughs> we couldn't figure out how to do co-op. Screw you. <laughs> <laughs> are they actually qualified beyond one of them owns a quarterstaff and the other kind of dresses like a ninja? Because they're not good at fighting. They're not good at anything, really. They're not good at jumping over objects that are only a foot tall. They're not good at running in a straight line. They're great at smashing windows, though, to get orbs from them. <laughs> yeah, like, maybe, it's just like a cockney looter simulator. <laughs> and it breaks my heart, because the streets kind of look okay till they smash the windows, and what's inside is looks nothing like a shop. It just looks like one of the alcoves from Doom. <laughs> There's a Chewbacca monster, and they're like, ah. <laughs> I'm also confused as to, like, what kind of shops they had where, like, they just put, like, a pistol and then, like, a glowing orb, like, next to each other in the window. And they're like, <laughs> I hope nobody, like, smashes the window and, like, takes the pistol and, and the glowing orb. Welcome to the dynamite and skull <laughs> shop. <laughs> There's monsters on the loose. No one will smash this window to take this pistol for personal safety, I'm sure. <laughs> it was a different time. Neighbors trusted neighbors with their guns just sitting in the window. It's a good neighborly gesture, if you think about it. A monster's coming at you, and you're like, Oh, Frank left his revolver in the window. I just have to smash it and get it, and I'm safe from the monster. So, maybe we're looking at it wrong. Wouldn't you put it in the mailbox, or, like, something you wouldn't have to smash? Well, then the kids might get their hands on it, and that's a whole different mess. <laughs> Plus, your neighbor will replace your window, so you don't have to worry about it. Oh, okay. So, very nice. But uh, your first task is to run through an actually pretty cool first level. Yes. It's got a nice layout. There's buttons. For some reason, there's no button for push button. Everyone has to kick giant buttons. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been to London, and I don't know if that's just a f how they do things. Like, I need to... <laughs> cross the street for the bus and everyone's just kicking the crap out of the, the pole trying to hit the walk button. <laughs> it, it's a cultural thing, you know, because soccer's very big over there. They're like, oh, well, you know, kick a soccer ball, kick a button. You know, it's all fun. Queen enters the room and just smacks a crate across the uh, floor. <laughs> just turning all the lights. That's my queen impression, by the way. Spot on. It's pretty much the only thing in the game that you can successfully kick repeatedly without some reason running across the room away from who you're fighting <laughs> i never found a successful way to fight a monster without letting it like hit me first so i knew it was in range 
because the monsters have this tried and true move where they just leap backwards from you when you take a swing and they keep leaping backwards until they like do a half room strike and they're on you and you're like what just happened I know, I'll spin the camera around so I can see what's going on, and then you realize there's no way to control the camera in this game. Yeah, th this game should have been called Nightmare Camera, because <laughs> it is just... You you forget how spoiled you've been in the era of dual analog, where like one stick controls how you move, and the other controls what you're looking at. And like back then, they were just kind of winging it almost. It was like, well, this camera's going to be sort of mounted behind you, but then it's going to go nuts half the time, and uh, good luck. Except the frustrating thing is Mario 64 had come out. There were just other people that were like, camera control? Ha <laughs> ha, no one needs that. <laughs> we're not going to do what that kid's toy does over there. We have serious games over on the PlayStation. I mean, Tomb Raider at least had a button you could press to kind of... Re you can manually control if you held it down, but if you just tapped it, it would at least reset it behind you. And, and this game's just like, we don't need that. We need more buttons for dodging and lunging. It kept telling me that I could do combos, and I looked up on the website, like, on the internet. They don't have a website for this game still. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, here's the combos, and then I'd push the buttons... And the enemy would be like, oh, after that first kick, I'm just going to leap backwards twice and you're stuck in this combo. And as you finish the combo, I'm going to leap forward and smack you. I'm like, who is this game for? So apparently the combos are unbreakable if you do them right. I've heard a lot of people talking about how great the unbreakable combos are. Well, apparently I'm just trash at this game. <laughs> <laughs> and because of you, London is full of nightmare creatures. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now I feel real bad. I, I got to the first boss. Right. The tube snake. Yeah, he's. I think he's called the sewer snake. It's like, I have raised the most evil creature in the world. What is it? The snewer snake. You, you didn't get to the second boss. The snowman. <laughs> and I crap you not, I think the third boss is Miguel Sanchez or something. <laughs> They're not great at naming bosses. It is Jose Manuel. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I had to look up the other bosses because after I get to the first boss and it just kept smacking me around, but they gave you no opportunity to like hit it unless its head was down on the ground. But the controls are so bad, I didn't know how to get out of the way and it killed me. And then I thought, you know, I bet if I don't stop playing this, I am going to put my fist through a screen of some sort that's displaying this game to me. So, dear listener, I could not could not finish this game. And I platinumed Bloodborne, and this game had me seeing just complete red with rage. You know there's a postage stamp sized picture of Adam Crowley rolling his eyes at you right now, right? And you know what? He <laughs> earned it. Because <laughs> I was trash at this game. I don't know if I was bad or the game was just so impossible to control. Because I watch videos online of people playing this. I'm like, how are they controlling this? This is impossible. The camera is following them at all times. And with me, the camera's like, hey, have you seen this door over here in this corner? I'm not even going to show you the action. You just hear yourself being eviscerated by a werewolf. <laughs> but look at the door. The texture is beautiful. <laughs> so, Brad, did you come up with a big question for this one? Not really. I can tell you one thing that I learned from, not learned, but... My experience of working at a game store during this time period gives me a little bit of insight. And uh, one thing I can tell you is that the very opening level or sub-level, I guess, that graveyard and, like, first street and then the graveyard that you go through to the first checkpoint, that was the demo that they gave away for free. Like, we had a big pile of them at the store. And on one hand, you can say that's the way to do a demo because that's like the best part of the game and people play and like it. On the other hand, if you had that demo, that's all the nightmare creatures you need. It It's all downhill from there. Like, <laughs> I played that demo a couple times. I'm like, this is super fun. And then I got the full game. So the demo worked effectively as marketing. And like, as soon as I got past the area that's covered in the demo, I'm like, this is horrible. Like, I don't want to do this. I guess my big question is, was that a good tactic or not? They got the sales. Yeah. 
they made it look like it was just going to be a really great product. And then after you hit that second checkpoint, they're like, we're out. <laughs> Name him Snowman. We're good. <laughs> so <laughs> I was looking through a list of enemies in this game. And I have a question. Yeah. The word P-E-P-Y. What is that spell? P-E-P-B. Peeps. It's not P-P? I, I learned this because he's a major character in Uncharted 4. And I every time I read it, I'm like, oh, it's Peppy. <laughs> but no, apparently it's Peeps. Because I thought that this game had a character named Peepee's Horror. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh no. <laughs> I'm being attacked by Peepee's Horror. <laughs> that is the sewer snake for you. <laughs> it's a... A creature with three heads that apparently is very easy to beat unless it gets its hands on you and then it rips you up. Did anyone read more about the snowman? Because what I saw confused me greatly. What? He's, he's an abominable snowman that throws snowballs at you. He's a nightmare creature. This is all fair, but what is he doing in London? London's not known for its snow and there's no snow in this game whatsoever. He's just like, yo, what's up? Um, I'm here. <laughs> so this is just a larger question I have about the enemies in general is, are they demons or were they experiments? Because early on, they're like, Adam Crowley was once a great scientist, but then he fell to the dark path. And he gets like this version of the Necronomicon and you're seeing things that don't appear to be people or corpses. And like... Did he make an abominable snowman? Did he think that would be festive? <laughs> and then by the end of the game, it's like, he took the last of his serum. And I'm like, what serum? Did they mention a serum? And he turns into a giant dragon. <laughs> they do not mention the serum until that last fight. And they're like, there's a serum, by the way. And <laughs> your, your priest with a staff is like, I did not see that coming. What a twist. <laughs> It's like the story's being told you by, like, a seven-year-old, and he's just, oh, and there was this serum! I forgot to tell you, but it's super important. Like, and then they fought a werewolf, and then there was a guy with four heads. I mean, that sums up the entire story. Yeah, if anybody out there is listening to this, and they're gonna make a PS1 game for some reason, uh, they're working on it in their basement or whatever, and it has monsters in it, uh, one thing I would advise you to do that Nightmare Creatures did not do is stick to the classics. Stick to really recognizable monsters, skeletons, zombies, werewolves. Like the first area of Nightmare Creatures is just werewolves and zombies and like a couple of gargoyles and it works fine. And then you get to the second section, all of a sudden they started to like invent some new monsters and like the PS1 graphics aren't great. You can't really make out what there's a... And it's like, does that... Does he have four arms and some heads? And what What am I fighting anymore? Like, just stick to easily recognized things. Uh, because the graphic quality and just, like, you're going to be moving around. You don't have time to just sit there and be like, what am I... Oh, I'm dead. I think the monster design for this game was, let's not get sued by the HP Lovecraft people so we'll make these hp lovecraft adjacent yeah you know like that's just like this like super powerful brand that you wouldn't want to tangle with <laughs> this is rb hate smith <laughs> like the dollar store knockoff of lovecraft <laughs> like going up against major league baseball or something where they're just gonna sue you and like get every trace of you removed so, so I worked on a title that was related to Lovecraft, and it actually turns out some of his stuff actually is owned by people, and others are public domain, so you actually have to tiptoe really carefully. And some things that arguably could be public domain, somebody could sue if they wanted to. So, it is an arcane nightmare of legal stuff. But that still doesn't explain why they have blue trolls in loincloths. A, just, a quick side story. I recently got uh, H.P. Lovecraft's Complete Works on Audible, and Rats in the Wall is read by Branson Pinchow. <laughs> Belky? Oh my god. And you haven't lived until you hear Cousin Belky read Rats in the Wall. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a new level of horror.
But, Mark, you wanted to discuss fashion in this game. So it's weird to me, because as I said, I'm not entirely clear what the lore of the monsters is. Like, was he using the dark arts to summon these creatures, or has he literally murdered scores of British citizens and turned them into monsters in his, like, handcrafted artisanal monster shop? You see in the opening cutscene, lovingly rendered, he's got a naked body in there, right, that he's working with and, like, tinkering with, and yet... Some of the monsters are weirdly dressed, and others are naked, and I'm just curious whether it was his choice whether or not they're naked, whether he gave them free will. Because, like, the zombies all dress like Homer Simpson. They've got, like, the white collared (laughs) short sleeve shirt and the blue (laughs) pants. And then the harpies are buck naked when they're flying around. And then you've got, like, the giant Papa Smurf with teeth going around, and he's got, like, fashionable trousers on. Maybe he was like, okay, I've only got clothes for some of you. You, you Homer Simpson guys, you're wearing that just to hide the fact that when you die, you get chopped in half. We got to have that weird overhang so the people don't know that you're two separate models. Children could be watching. (laughs) That's how I assume Crowley talks. I have another question. Why didn't these two fools just light London on fire again? Because that seems like a better option than what they did. (laughs) It's not like there are any innocent people like running around London that they have to save. That that was my other question is, did they turn everyone into nightmare creatures? Or like, are there innocent people in their homes getting their windows smashed and their guns and orbs stolen? There was great Uncle Hector's orb and that ninja girl just vanished with it. It. Like, you, you play Resident Evil, and one of the first things you find is an honest-to-God dead body because there's monsters here and they kill people. But nightmare creatures, all these guys just seem to be, like, wandering around jolly old England waiting to find, like, a ninja and a priest. There's a good joke beginning right there. I don't know what it is, so... <laughs> no, I mean, if a monster was running around and I had a, a nice, thick oak door, I'm just gonna lock it and not go outside. Because it doesn't seem the monsters are intelligent enough enough to open a door you can stare at one over a fence and he just stands there staring at you and he won't attack until you knock the fence down then he's like holy crap there's a ninja girl here i better attack i didn't know you could do that to the fence (laughs) it seems the barrier to entry is a closed door and these monsters are useless so adam's like oh come on kill everyone and they're like boss the doors are shut what do you want us to do don't make me take my serum (laughs) what serum boss (laughs) you know the serum didn't i tell you guys about it staging this attack at night is like super ineffective then because these these monsters can't open doors they can't knock down walls or even break the windows with the guns in them (laughs) people are just at home at night you know like it's the 1800s it's not like you're gonna go out clubbing or something it's just like oh i worked in a factory for 12 hours i'm gonna go sleep on my rotten cot and go back to it in the morning and like you're not out so like you just release all these monsters on the streets of london it's like yeah that that's fine Sure beats the urchins. Maybe that's why Adam's in the corner on the load screens. He's just walking around looking for people. He's knocking on doors. He's like, would you guys like to come outside for no reason at all? (laughs) Is it to get eaten by your monsters? (laughs) No. (laughs) I want to show you my elixir. (laughs) Going back to your, like, why don't they just burn it all to the ground? Doesn't that actually happen at the end of the game? Like, when you're fighting him in his, like, dragon infernal form, like, half of London seems to be burning, and I'm not entirely clear who set the fire. I'm gonna guess the dragon. (laughs) The last time there was a fire in London, wasn't it to stop people from going dragon and making elixirs? Maybe he was like, if I turn into a dragon, dragons like fire, so even if they light London on fire, I'll survive. (laughs) He's like, I'll preemptively burn it to the ground. (laughs) This seems to be in line with his thought process for everything, which is, I don't have a plan, but we're going to get this done. I mean, he's got Sewer Snake, (laughs) Snowman, and just a guy named Jose Manuel. Who just throws knives, and the only way you can defeat him is to just 
flip the switch that crushes him. <laughs> He's just trying to defend himself from a crazy monk with a quarter staff. He's like, get away. <laughs> well, maybe he's not even a monster. Maybe he's one of the few normal citizens around. And he's like, oh my God, what's that? There's a monk and, and some uh, archaeologist that dress like a prostitute just trying to murder him. I mean, is there any point where Manuel was like, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not murder. And the monk's like, I don't even know what that means. And he kicks the button and kills him. It's like, that monster was weird. <laughs> the commandments don't relate to Spaniards. Yeah, they're probably just like super bigoted. So they're like, oh, a werewolf. Oh, a gargoyle. Oh, a Spaniard. Get it. Adam Crowley comes in. He's like, what are you doing? That wasn't one of mine. He was just a tourist. You're, you're sick, monk. You're real sick. <laughs> So, uh, I have a question relating to a game that came out recently that I own. The Order 1886. Is that a sequel to Nightmare Creatures? Like, 50 years later, did they screw up and there's still monsters running around? And they're like, we gotta get guns and roll, boys. Maybe, because God knows, people want more Nightmare Creatures. There's this vast untapped market. You could make the argument that Nightmare Creatures is a cool idea. Everyone loves creatures and nightmares. <laughs> yeah. Victorian England and darkness and fog and monsters. It's all it's all fun, but it was kind of taken apart by maybe being a little ahead of its time and also being like really incompetently done. <laughs> and you could say that the idea is good and now only recently like games are starting to actually capitalize on the idea and make it good so like you have the order uh bloodborne is like what nightmare creatures would be if it was like a billion times better yeah i agree i mean i saw like the early dna of the souls like definitely bloodborne you got this victorian setting werewolves jumping out well in bloodborne they actually know how to bash down a door <laughs> and scare the bejesus out of me at 4 a.m <laughs> i'm like i don't know how this couch got wet it was like this when i got here <laughs> You probably could draw a line between Bloodborne and Nightmare Creatures where someone played it in their youth and was like, this is amazing, and someday I'm going to make this better with a camera you can control and maybe a dodge that works. And more sewer snakes. Okay, so Bloodborne has the most horrific creature in a video game ever. And its name is Pile of Snakes. <laughs> and it is a pile of snakes that slowly creeps at you with like 40 heads sticking out of it. And I'm not afraid of snakes. But when I saw this thing, because it's like oozy and gooey and it's hissing, I became afraid of snakes. It's... I don't know if you guys have seen this in Bloodborne. It's horrific. I have not, but it, it sounds terrible. It sounds lovely. It, it would be a good birthday present for a loved one. <laughs> that you hate. <laughs> so, I guess you thwart Adam's plan. Well, you cut off his head. You, like, kick it off. <laughs> yes, but in the process of decapitating, you are thwarting his plan. But... Did he ever go into what his plan was? Just like, I'm going to infest London with monsters. What was step two of that plan? Was it like, now I've got London, I guess. <laughs> awesome. All right, all monsters on a boat. We're going to the <laughs> States. <laughs> we'll make it big on Broadway. <laughs> Zombies, I want you wearing your pants. It's just going to be like... At the end of King Kong, where they just take him to New York and the whole show is to just kind of look at King Kong like, that was going to be his plan. He's just going to get to New York and be like, here's a bunch of monsters. Nightmare Cabaret. <laughs> Only Mondays and Wednesdays. You can't get tickets. It's that horrific. <laughs> so, so the sequel, he goes to Paris. So like, apparently he's got a whole world tour plan. Wait, Adam goes to Paris? Yes, because the sequel takes place. Dead Adam? Oh yeah, he comes back. But as far as I know, there's no real good explanation other than like, he's been resurrected. <laughs> and it takes place long in the future, and he goes to uh, the Eiffel Tower and tries blowing that up with a tentacle creature. As one does. He really hates the EU. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have to admire the guy by just not having a plan, and he just does things. Like, the entire first Nightmare Creatures, you're always on his tail, and while that f seems fun... 
this narrative is like, he went to a bar. Now he's on a boat. And he's like, friggin' where's Waldo? <laughs> he's just <laughs> kicking around London with his nightmare creatures. Yeah, I did enjoy every once in a while you'd just see him like run through like a low fence through a doorway. And your guy's like, oh, there he was. This really old person that I probably could catch in four steps. But, oh, he vanished. Oh, well. <laughs> Well, and the final battle takes you back to his house, right? Like, you could have gone there in the first place instead of mucking around in the sewers and <laughs> finding Jose Manuel. Knocks on his door. He's like, hello? I, I'm i here to kill you. My elixir's not ready. Can you, like, go to the sewers? <laughs> then go to the church? Uh, meet my friend Jose. Tee hee hee. And then come back here. <laughs> He's like, cool. I mean, they know a lot about him. No one thought to check his house, though. A ninja should know to check a house. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, th this was the days before LinkedIn and Facebook. It's not like they could quickly find out where his base of operations was. They had to just ask the butcher, the baker, the candlestick goblin. Adam checked in at his house. There's an item in the game that I'm not 100% sure I understood how it worked. And it was like this like green potion in a bottle that I think just made all the enemies really stupid. Because, like, I'd hit them with it, and, like, they'd just run around and not, like, they'd still be attacking, but it wouldn't, like, they'd go, like, beat up the wall for a while. Like, what was that item supposed to be? Absinthe? <laughs> it did come in a green bottle. <laughs> it's the failed elixir. <laughs> no, you took the stupid juice! But for some reason, when you drink the stupid juice, everyone around you gets stupid. It's probably a perception thing. You're like, all you guys are idiots hitting walls and stuff. And they're like, what's wrong with that guy over there? <laughs> it's like, I have a gun. <laughs> oh, no, he's got a gun. <laughs> he's got one of those guns that can shoot 360 degrees somehow. It's so weird that the gun is best known for, like, its ability to shoot things all around you as opposed to directly in front of you. There's problems with that because you are directly behind the gun when you pull that trigger, so... Yeah, I was wondering about that. Like, how are you not getting friendly fire? Maybe it's like the biplanes that had machine guns on them and they could shoot without <laughs> blowing the propellers off. Like, exact science was done to figure out where you would be standing when you pulled that trigger. A tail gunner flintlock? <laughs> all, all the monsters are like, just get right behind him! Get between him! Put him between you and the gun and you'll be fine. <laughs> then Adam's like, why are you doing a cool conga line? <laughs> <laughs> I believe the three of us can agree Nightmare Creatures is a disaster. And every time I look at my notes, I just see PP's horror. <laughs> Quickly, we have to talk about 1998, where this was ported to the N64. Yes. And the opening cinema wasn't there because it couldn't handle the video so there's a text crawl when you start the mission but it only renders one line at a time and the other two are in like this dense fog and it's going so fast like i don't even know what's going on in this story and the draw distance is less than the playstation <laughs> i think that intro is just getting you ready for the game you know it's like get used to this like you're not going to be able to see more than a foot in front of you and Bad stuff's going to happen, and you're not going to know what's going on. Oh, and it's all darker. They're like, oh, we can't port this lighting engine, apparently. So we'll just bring the, the saturation of these textures down. It's like, is something wrong with this? What is going on? There's a light slider in the, the menu, and you crank it all the way up, and you're like, nope, that didn't help. Then you look at the PlayStation version, and you're like, oh, my eyes! And not just because it looks terrible. I can get why they wouldn't have the FMVs, but they don't even have, like, pictures, which is weird. Like, when you get to the end of a level, it just brings up the title crawl. It's like, and then Adam Crowley went into a sewer. While well, it's just you standing in the middle of a room with no sewer in sight. <laughs> like, how hard would it be just to show the still from PlayStation with him, like, half in the sewer? It's all someone was like, I guess we can port it. Shrug. <laughs> We're porting this out of spite. 
Interns. It, it's entirely possible that, you know, the N64 port and Nightmare Creatures wasn't, like, Activision's highest priority at that point. Well, apparently Nightmare Creatures 2 was ported to the Dreamcast, and when they did that, they didn't change anything. It just looked like a PS1 game running on the Dreamcast. To be fair, like, 50% of the Dreamcast library looked like a <laughs> PS1 game running on the Dreamcast. Fair enough. It feels like a weird game to me that's stuck in between eras. Like, it starts off with high-quality FMVs and a crap ton of lore, but then it plays like Splatterhouse, like an old arcade beat-em-up. Like, they barely tell a story as you go from one section to another, and then it just ends with the boss's head falling off the end. We don't know how to get out of this, guys, so I, I guess just put the end on the screen and everyone will be sad. No one's actually going to get here. The control is so garbage. <laughs> Oi! Me head's falling off! <laughs> <laughs> but the serum! No! <laughs> but, yeah, I, I agree with you. It was It was stuck in a weird place. It's kind of like how I felt about Bushido Blade, where if you made Bushido Blade now, people would highly appreciate Bushido Blade. But back then, they're like, ah, fighting game broken. Return to store. (laughs) But here, I I say if Activision picked up the phone and said, hey, from software, we have the hottest title that you probably want to get your hands on. You add the Dark Souls Bloodborne combat to this, you could actually have something pretty cool. It'd be called Bloodborne 2. Everyone in Bloodborne is in their house and you just walk up and knock on the door and they're like, go away, I hate you, you're a hunter. <laughs> and that pretty much lines up with this game where no one's on the streets. So it could be something. I mean, the last time we talked about uh, Fear Effect, we are like, oh, someone is remaking this. Ta-da! It was like a week after we talked about it, they're like, Fear Effect, the remake coming. We're like, whoa. <laughs> in in the pre-show, uh, we didn't know this going in when we decided to do a show about this game, but, but Mark told us uh, they're working on a new Nightmare Creatures. Uh, according to cursory research, at least three different channels have the same trailer for the new Xbox One uh, Nightmare Creatures. And it's a terrible trailer that is basically just zooming through a darkened corridor, ending on uh, Adam Crowley's face, which is, of course, as stylized as it's always been, so it's hard to tell if it's like some amateur fan thing or actually what they're going for. (laughs) But yeah, as far as I can tell, they are actually doing a new Nightmare Creatures. Like, the trailer came out last week. If someone is making a new Nightmare Creatures and you're listening to this, uh, our email is in the show notes, (laughs) and please contact us, (laughs) because we would like to talk about it, because it has some problems, but it has so much potential. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I love horror games, and I love horror games with lots of monsters, so this game is almost there. If you give me the right thumbstick this game could get so much further. I guess that was Nightmare Creatures, guys. We drank the elixir, we turned into a dragon, we roared about this game, we managed to not burn London down. If Also, if you're in the fire of 1666, email us. <laughs> that would be a fun email to get. <laughs> any closing thoughts on Nightmare Creatures? No. D- did you actually do any research on who Samuel uh, Peepees is? Uh, <laughs> He was a guy who was arrested for indecent exposure in London. So apparently he's famous for actually having a diary. And like, that's his thing, is he just was incredibly anal retentive about his diary. And for 30 years, kept a perfect diary of all the events in his life. So historically, people enjoy reading it because it gives you an idea of the time period. Um, And then he just stopped writing. So that's why some people come up with, like, that's because he fell to the dark arts and had a darker journal. But, like, he stopped writing because he had eyesight problems and he chalked it up to writing too much. Huh. (laughs) Maybe writing by candlelight is not the best way to write. Potentially. We need to build a time machine, go back in time, be like, here's an LED bulb. (laughs) Now go invent a power plant to actually make it work it's like i'm too busy working on this elixir it'll change everything (laughs) oh no don't do that that. (laughs) i call it red bull it shall give me wings
<laughs> no, I think that wraps it up for our very spooky Halloween episode of Cartridge Based Radio. And it wraps up our fall of 97, Brad. We've been working on this for, what, seven years, it feels like, at this point. <laughs> After the San Francisco rush that just took the wind out of my sails. <laughs> you know, think about some of the games that we didn't get around to. Like, Test Drive 4 was pretty horrific. Um fighting force came out that fall i mean you know we passed over a lot of garbage uh to kind of just focus on the good stuff and also nightmare creatures and san francisco rush (laughs) no we we front loaded it with great games uh i'd never played nightmare creatures before i was really excited at the beginning of the week then about wednesday that had worn off (laughs) and then earlier today when i was trying to play it again uh, I fell into deep despair. <laughs> I believe that is the correct art. And then in 97, the next step would be going to EB Games. And they're like, we'll give you a dollar back for it. Th- this was back when, when EB still had like good return policies. Like You could have just brought that sucker back. But I'm like, I would like my full refund. And also one of those demos off of the counter, please. Because that's all the nightmare creatures I need. <laughs> You know, one final thought I have on this game is I got about halfway through what I thought was the second level, only to be informed by you that it was actually just the second part of the first level. And I just, I have to wonder, like, how much demand for nightmare creatures did the people making this game think that, like, their audience would have? Because they wildly overestimated it. Like, between the demo that has all the good parts of the game and just the fact that this game apparently is a lot longer than I realized, like, there's just way overconfident on how much nightmare creatures they thought we'd want to play they thought we wanted to play it all remember how many army man games they made (laughs) like at some point people just get locked onto an idea whether someone's buying it or not and they just keep on going much nicer back in the playstation days they're like yeah you can make a sequel how'd the first one sales oh we don't care just make a sequel (laughs) (laughs) well you have bruce willis yeah put him in a game oh uh, that will do it for our, our extravaganza For Halloween, I hope you have a spooky Halloween. Don't jump out of bushes at kids, because usually there's an adult who will punch you in the face. That's why I wear a hockey mask when I do it. (laughs) Then they will punch you in the sternum, (laughs) and being punched in the sternum is almost worse than the face. (laughs) Thanks for stopping by, Mark. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for not traumatizing as much as last time. (laughs) We had just recovered, and we're like, we should have him back on for a horror episode. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Donald, uh, that was Brad, and that was Mark, and we will see you next week. It was actually terrifying. I could, I could see you guys, and I was talking to you, but you thought I'd lost the connection, and I thought I was a ghost. Have I lost you again?